So last week we looked at section uh, 1.1 with the assembly Friday. Um, so we didn't do anything after after that section. So we're going to look at 1.2. Um, the first thing they mention in section 1.2 is kind of a, a general approach to solving a problem. Uh, not even necessarily a math problem, just any, any kind of problem. And whenever you're reading a problem, the first thing you've got to figure out is, okay, what, what did they give me to work with? And what is it that they're asking me to try to find? Okay, so that's the first step. Just kind of break down what is it that I know, what is it that I have to try to figure out. Okay, the next thing is to try to come up with um, some kind of method to solve that problem. Okay, drawing a picture is something we'll do quite a bit. Okay, if they give you a problem and they say like, you know, you've got a swimming pool and these are the dimensions, and maybe you've got like a, you know, a sidewalk this many feet away, if they're going to give you a lot of description like that, it's going to be easier to just make a picture so we can see what's going on. Um, sometimes making a list can be helpful, um, as long as the list doesn't get too big. Like if I said to you, tell me all the different ways you can arrange the letters A, B, and C. You could make a list. There's not that many. There's only six. But if I said, how many different ways can you arrange the letters A through H? Well, there's a lot. Okay, so it could be, could be millions. So if a list starts to get big, it's not practical. And setting up an equation. I would say just about every problem at some point is going to have to make an equation. Some equations, we might have a hint at what we're looking for. Like if the problem says that area of a rectangle is 20 square inches. Well, we know we're dealing with the area of a rectangle, so you can look up what that formula is. Sometimes you might have to come up with your own formula. Depends on the problem. We're going to do one in a minute where uh, we need to just come up with our own form. All right, um, so once we decide what method we're going to use, then we actually try to solve the problem. The two main approaches that we're going to use to solving problems are either algebraic, which means we do, you know, do the algebra, L, or graphical, which means we use the calculator to sketch a picture and then do something with the picture. Any questions on those steps? They're very general, just kind of a overview. All right, so here is our problem. It says to write an equation, so they're actually telling you which method to use. You're not, you're not drawing a picture at this point. So write an equation to model the following. Um, there's a company that charges $15 to rent a car, and then it's 20 cents for every mile you drive. This problem is going to have two variables in it. Does anybody have an idea what one of the variables is going to represent? Yeah? How far you're going to go? Yeah. One of them is going to represent how many miles you drive the car, and how many miles you drive the car is going to control the other variable. The cost, exactly. Now, I said, the way I said it, I said the number of miles is going to control the cost. Not the other way around. Right? You don't generally go in, pay for the car, like pay $200, and then you can drive that many miles with the car. No, you, you just drive how many, however many miles you need to drive. And then when you're done at the end of your trip, you go and pay for the car. So the cost is dependent on the number of miles. So we're going to get to this in 1.3, but cost is called your dependent variable. It's always your y. Um, does anybody know what the other name is? If y is the dependent, x is the independent. independent. Yep. The x is our independent variable. Okay. So we want to make an equation. It starts out y equals. Anybody think they could give me an equation that would represent $15 to rent a car plus 
20 cents for every mile that you drive. Yeah, um, 15 plus 0.20x. Yeah. I wrote it in a different order than she said, but that's the same thing, 0.20x plus 15. What format is that that I wrote it in? Y equals mx plus b. Yeah, this is a linear problem. So I did it in y equals mx plus b. And that's all that one. Okay, we're going to use that equation to do something, but for now, that's it. Uh, any questions on that formula? Yeah. So now, I want to find, using my model, using my equation, Find the cost if I drive 50 miles. Caleb, if I'm going to drive 50 miles, where would that 50 get plugged in? Would it be the Y or the X? Yeah, it's the X. X is miles. So let's fill in 50 for X. Take that in on our calculator and see what we get. Point two times fifty plus fifteen. Except you want point two. Okay, so that's twenty-five. And what is that? Twenty-five dollars. Dollars, right? Not miles. It's twenty-five dollars. Yep. Okay. The next one, uh, hundred miles. Okay. So plug in hundred. And what we're doing right now, this is basically called evaluating. Evaluating is when you take a number, you plug it in for a letter, and you just calculate the answer. There's no algebra involved because the variable is already by itself. A Y. Okay, 0.2 times 100, that's going to give me 20. And 20 plus 15 is how much? 35. 35, yep. And again, that's dollars. Any question on using the formula to get the cost for those two mileages? Okay. So what we came up with, that's called the algebraic representation of our problem. If somebody walked in right now and they just looked at that equation, 0.20x plus 15, they have no idea that that's about renting a car. The algebraic representation kind of takes all the details about the word problem and just condenses it down to an equation. To know what that equation means, you'd have to go back and read the problem, right? The $15 and the 20 cents per mile. So in the homework, if you see something like find an algebraic representation of the problem, it just means write an equation. Alright, so using that same example, let's try something a little different. Let's say that Sarah was charged $50 to rent the car. I want to figure out how many miles she drove. What's, um, what's a little bit different about the kind of question they're asking now versus the two that we just did? On e? They give you the total cost. They give you the cost which means you're going to plug that in for what letter? Y. Right. We're going to fill that in for Y. Now we need to do algebra and solve for X. No. So we're going to take the $50 and we're going to fill it in and then get X by itself. And let's, let's do that. So 50 equals. Point. 20x, or you could do 0.2, it's the same thing. 0.20x plus 50. Okay, um, James, what's my first step um, to get x by itself there? Um, subtract by 50. Plus 15. Okay, so 35 equals 0.20x. And Brett, what about my last step? Divide by 0.20. Okay, so divide 
by 0.20, that's gone. Divide by 0.20. And Alejandro, when I divide 35 by 0.20, is it going to get bigger or smaller? Bigger. Yeah, it's going to get bigger because you're dividing by a decimal. Right? So 35 divided by 0.20 gives me 175 what? Miles. Miles. So if she paid $50, um, that's how far she drove the car. All right. So that's one way you can solve it, filling in 50 for y and then getting x by itself. Uh, what I want to show you is a different way that if you had to use this calculator, you might, you might not have seen this. All right, so on the calculator, you're going to press the y equals button in the upper left. If you have anything else on the screen like I do right now, uh, we need to clear that out. So we're just going to press clear and clear. And I'm going to go back up to Y1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that step where I had 50 equals 0.20x plus 15. What I want you to do is put 50, so basically the left hand side where it says y1, and we're going to put the right hand side in y2. So that's going to be y1, that's going to be y2. So 50, I made the colors match up. The blue one is 50, and the red one. 20x plus 15. Now, we're still looking for where the, the left side equals the right side. How did you write the x again? Was it just alpha x or something else? Uh, the x is the button right below the mode. Oh, nice. Yep. So we're still looking for where these are equal. But we're not going to look where they're equal and use an algebra method. We're going to graph it. So we're going to have a blue picture. We're going to have a red picture. What do you think it means when we're looking for where the blue graph and the red graph are equal to each other. What do you think that means as like a picture? Like a, like an intersecting line? Yeah, where they intersect. Okay, so when you set up this kind of thing, you put something in Y1 and Y2, we're usually going to be looking for where they cross. Does anybody remember what window did I say you should always start with? If you're not sure, zoom out. Mm, no, not zoom out. Oh, oh, zoom standard, yeah. That just gives you negative 10 to 10. It might not be good. We know only going up to 10 on the x-axis isn't anywhere near high enough for this problem. But we only know that because we already saw it. All right, let's think about um, x. x is mileage. Does it make sense to drive the car negative 10 miles? No, what's the smallest number of miles you could potentially drive the car? Yeah. Um, even less. Zero. Yeah, zero. You could just decide, well, I'm not even going to rent a car, so I don't drive it at all. And if you never called to rent the car, the smallest amount of money you could pay for this would be? Zero. Zero. No. Now, this first one, y equals 50. That's a horizontal line at 50. Am I going to see a horizontal line at 50 if my y max is at 10? No. No. I got to go higher than 50. So let's, let's set it at like 60, just so it's not right on the edge of the screen. If you hit graph, you will see a horizontal line now. But can we see where the red one and the blue one are crossing? No, it's still way off the screen. Which number now do I need to set higher so I can go further to the right? Yeah. And we already know how high we need to set x. So let's just go all the way to like 200. So there's my horizontal line of 50. 
Now I can see where my red line crosses. And what we're going to do is calculate exactly where they cross. And the way you do it, press the second button, okay, in the upper left, and then press trace. Okay, second trace, that's the calculate menu. Okay, I didn't get what you got. You wrote for y1 you got 50 and then y2 you got 20x plus 15. 0.2x plus 15. Oh. Yeah. Right. Now we're looking for where these two lines cross. Anybody have a guess uh, which option we're going to pick there? Yeah. Five. Five. Intersect. Once you press intersect, the calculator asks you three things. First thing it, a it asks you is pick a point somewhere on the first line that you want to use. Doesn't matter where. You just basically have to let the calculator know use the blue one. So anywhere on the blue one, hit enter. Now it says second curve. Basically that means tell it the second thing you want to use. I want to use the red one. And the last thing is the guess. Um, the guess doesn't matter. I'll show you in a minute when it would. But right now it doesn't. If you want to put it close to where you think they cross, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Basically just hit it. And if you did everything right, it should give you the intersection point right there. X is 175, and that's exactly what, what we found. Okay, so the reason I did that graphically is because I wanted to show you how to calculate an intersect. Uh, is there any question on how to calculate an intersect? I think, I don't know. It says 175.75. Do you think you could do that one more time real quick? And it says intersection right there? No, it doesn't say that. Okay, yeah, then it didn't calculate the intersect. So you're going to do second, calc, option five. Pick a point somewhere on the blue, hit enter. Somewhere on the red, hit enter. And then again, the guess doesn't matter at all. I can put the guess way over here if I want to. Wait, so I'm here, I'm somewhere on the blue. Yep. And, you press and then you press enter. And then somewhere on the red. Yep. And now it should say second curve. And then the last thing it should ask you for is the guess. Okay. And then what? And then just hit enter. And then it'll say intersection 175. Now, let me show you where the guess would matter. First, any questions on this before I show you where it does matter? Okay. Let's say you had a graph that looked like, again, just, just watch me do this one. You don't have to type this in. Um, how many intersection points are on the screen now? Well, in a second. Uh, let me fix it. Just give it a second. But how many intersection points do you see now? Two. Two. The calculator can only do one at a time. Wherever you put the guess, that's the one that it will give you. So if I do second calc intersect, pick a point somewhere on the blue, hit enter. Anywhere you want on the red, hit enter. I don't understand the point of like picking anywhere. Like, I'll show you. And now, if I put my guess here and I hit enter, it's going to give me the one on the right. If I move my guess over here and hit enter, it's going to give me the one on the left. Okay. So the guess matters when you have multiple ones on the screen. So now, the point of picking the anywhere on the blue and anywhere on the red. All right. Let's say you had this. Let's graph that. Uh, well, let me make it a little easier. It would work, but let me just make it a little easier to see. So when you're graphing, you can have up to, I think, 10 different graphs on the screen at the same time. So right now, I have three. When I graph, and I want the calculator to find an intersect, I need to tell the calculator which two lines do I want to use. 
do I want to find where the blue and the black one cross? Do I want to find where the blue and the red cross? Or do I want to find where the black, I don't know which one I didn't say, black and the blue, maybe. So you, that's, how, that's why sometimes you have to pick the two. Well, let's say I wanted to figure out where the red and the black cross. I would do second calc intersect. Well, I'm on the blue. That's not the one I said. I said red and black. So if I press the up arrow, that's the black. I don't want the black and the blue. I want the black and the red. So I'm picking a point anywhere on the two. So now the calculator knows what it's looking for. And then I can do my guess. Because the black and the red only cross in one spot. And they cross exactly at the point two comma three. So that's the point. In this problem, there really wasn't a point. But in other problems, there will be. Okay. Any other questions on finding an intercept? Last thing in 1.2, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at 1.3, um, is what's called a complete graph. So sometimes they call it a complete window. A complete window is a window where you can see everything that's important. Well, what's important? Uh, let's say I had this graph. Um, let's say x squared plus 10. For that graph, I would say that is not a complete window. That's a very bad window. I can't see any of it. So I would say for a graph that's like a U-shape, you should be able to see the U-shape. So if you adjust your window, maybe try something like 20. Yeah, that's good. That's a complete graph. Now I can actually see the shape of the graph. Right. Um, let's say you had a graph that um, maybe a, where it crosses the x-axis, um, or maybe where two graphs cross each other. So when we did the, um, the rent-a-car problem, at first, where the two lines crossed was way off the screen. We had to zoom out till we could see it. So that's the idea of a complete graph, being able to see everything that's important in your problem. When you're asked to find a complete graph, all you have to do is write down the window. And the window consists of four numbers, x min, x max, y min, y max. Those are the four numbers you write down. just did that one. Let's do a little different. Let's type in, uh, let's try y equals x minus 2, x minus 3, and x plus 4. Okay, let's type that in. Now, I didn't, I didn't foil it all out. I could. I, I just don't want to do that right now. So I'm going to let the calculator handle multiple. Type in, in parentheses, x minus 2, parentheses, x minus 3, and then in parentheses, x plus 4. Just like that. And we're going to do zoom 6, set the calculator window back, back the way it was, and then hit graph and see how it looks. Okay. Does that look like um, a good window? What do you think? What do you, what direction do you think I need to look in a little bit more? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, these are probably connecting. It's probably curving, but I can't see it. So that would not be a complete window. Um, how much up do we have to go? I'm not sure. Let's try setting the y max at fifty. did it. That was just a guess. 
So that, I would say that is a complete window now. Is that the only complete window? No, you probably could have done 40, maybe. Yeah, you probably could have done 40, you could do 60, 70. You know, there's a lot of different answers, but that I would say is one of them. So the four important ones that we have to look at are the X and Y and the max? Yeah. Okay. So now if you were gonna write this all down, let me show you what you would write down. I'd be looking for are these two and those two. Yeah. X min max, Y min max. So I, did, I wrote down like for the Y1, Y2, Y3, like everything you did, I think. But mm -hmm. oh, you did the same thing. That's why I wrote it. Now, if you set the Y max too high, you're like, you know what, I'll just set it to like 9,000. Because if I go that high, I'll probably see everything. Well, that. This is not a good window anymore. Remember the nice curve shape it had? Like I can't tell what I'm looking at at all. Kind of just looks like something that's pretty flat and then it just curves a little bit at the end. Uh, not a good window. That's not good. But that, that one was good. So this particular graph, I think it looks something kind of like, like that. That's called a cubic. The reason it's a cubic is because if you foiled all this out, you did every, everything out, multiplied it all, you would end up with an x cubed in the formula somewhere. Does anybody know what you call a graph that's one step down from that? You don't end up with a 3 in the exponent. You end up with a 2. An equation where the highest exponent is a 2. Yeah? That's called a quadratic. And do you know the shape of a quadratic when you graph it? Uh, what's it called? Um, parabola, or parabola. Parabola. Yep. Parabola. So I changed it a little bit. But let's just say if you graph something where the highest exponent is a 2, it doesn't matter if you do a plus 10 or something like that. It just moves it up and down. If you graph something where the highest exponent is a 2, that is called a parabola. I just wanted to mention the name of that shape. All right, let's try graphing another one. Um, y equals the square root of x plus 20. Um, I'm not sure if I showed you how you type a square root in yet. Anybody know um, how you get to the square root button? Yeah. Second and then the x squared. Yep. Yeah. Now, we've got to be careful with square roots because you can only take the square root of a certain kind of number. If you don't, you're going to end up with an imaginary answer. Does anybody know what kind of numbers you're allowed to take the square root of? Yep. Yeah? Perfect square root. Uh, you can take the square root of numbers there. You can do like the square root of 3. Oh, You'll well, get an positive. answer. Positive and one other number. You can take the square root of. It's not positive, but you can definitely take the square root of it. Um, real numbers, negative five. Is it all counting numbers? So like 0, 1, 2, 3? Um, well, positive numbers covers more because positive includes fractions and decimals, which you can use. So it's all positive numbers and something else. Negatives? No. You can't take the square root of a negative. You're going to get an imaginary. But what else can you take the square root of besides positive numbers? It's an exponent certain positive number. Um, well, it depends if it's, it depends on the problem, but um, like if you had like, you know, 3 squared, that would be a positive number. But if you had negative 3 to the fifth, you know, that would be a negative number. But so it's, yeah, it depends on the problem. Um, but what else is there besides positives and negatives? Zero. zero. You can take the square root of any number that is zero or higher. You cannot take the square root of something less than zero 
if you're dealing with real numbers. Okay, try to take the square root of negative two. It's going to say non-real answer on the calculator. So if x plus 20 has to come out to something that's 0 or higher, how could I figure out what x has to come out to in this problem? Like you couldn't let x be negative 100. If you plug in negative 100 and you add 20, you get negative 80. You can't take the square root of negative 80. That's a negative number. Yeah? What about negative 19.1? So then just less than negative 20? Uh, say it again, x has to be uh, greater than negative 20. Greater than or equal, to. or equal to, yes. x has to be greater than or equal to negative 20 in this problem. And as long as you do that, I guarantee you what you just circled there will come out zero or higher. But you've got to let x be negative 20 or more. So the reason it's helpful to figure that out is because that tells us where to set the window. If you don't want the negative 20 right on the edge, you can go a little bit further. You're not going to see anything further, but it just will move it in from the edge a little bit. So for the window, I might do like negative 25. All right, and let's set um, the y min and max back to what it would be on the standard window, negative 10 to 10. And hit graph. Okay, that's a good picture. Square root functions look like a parabola on their side. Specifically, it's only half the parabola. The way you would have gotten the bottom part is if they said to type in this, which they didn't. But that would give you the bottom part. Okay, so in this case, it is just the top, just the blue part. If you did a standard window, um, would that be a complete graph in this case? No. Because no. if you get a standard window, you'd basically be looking at like 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, you'd be looking at somewhere like in there. Right? It wouldn't, wouldn't be the whole window. It wouldn't be the whole picture. So find a complete graph. Let's just write down what we used for the window. Min and max, uh, y min and max. So what, are, what do you want for an answer there? Just what I just circled. Yep, exactly. So we write that out where it says find a complete graph? Or mm -hmm. what? You write those four things out. Okay. Yep. Another way you can write it, if you don't want to write it that way, you can write um, negative 25 to 10 and negative 10 to 10. I think we talked about this the first day. But that's your x min, x max, y min, y max. Does your y min and y max kind of stay the same? Yeah, I would, you, for this problem you could keep them the same. There's no reason um, you really need to change them. I mean, if you put the y min, like if you wanted to squeeze it a little bit so it looked a little bigger on the screen, I mean, you could do that. that that's a like your answer is what I'm saying? No, that's still a complete graph. Yep. So there's lots of answers that are complete graphs. Here's an answer that would not be a complete graph. Set your y min at 5. Uh, leave that at 10. Set that at 5. That's, that's bad. Now you've lost the whole, you've almost lost the entire graph now. Yeah. Okay, any other questions on that? Okay, um, so let me, before I put up the next thing, let, 
I'm going to let you cop just copy that part down. That's going to be part of tonight's homework. So I'm being 26 through 10, 18 and 29. So the last thing we're going to look at today is 1.3, and that's on what we call functions. So the first thing they talk about in the function section are the names for the x and y variable, and I kind of already touched on these a little bit. Besides calling them the x and the y, I told you guys that x is called the independent variable, and the y is the dependent. The other names you'll see for x are input and the domain. Basically, the x is whatever number you plug into the formula. The y is the answer that you get out of the formula. So the y is called the output, and it's also called the range. Not every graph that you draw is a function. There's a certain test uh, that it has to pass that a lot of people remember the name of this test because it's like a visual kind of thing. Um, does anybody know the name of the test I'm thinking of? And if it passes it, it means that whatever you drew is a function. It's the something something test. First word begins with a B. Yep. Right, the vertical line test. So visually, if something is a function, it passes the vertical line test. What does that really mean? It means that whenever you plug in a number for x, you get exactly one answer for y. That's a function. If you plug in a number for x, like 5, I guarantee you everybody will get one answer for y. You should all get 11. If you plug in 5 for x, there's no other answer besides 11. There's exactly one answer. Here's something that is not a function. Uh, let's do... Do this. Y equals plus or minus square root two x. Okay, if you plug in eight, what's eight times two? Sixteen. Sixteen. Now what's the positive square root of sixteen? Well, Alejandro, what's the positive square root of 16? Four. Four. So if you plug in 8 for x, you get 4 for y. Now let's do it again. 8 times 2 is 16. What's the negative square root of 16? Negative 4. That is not a function. If you plug in 8 for x, you get two different answers for y. Not a function. And visually, that means it passes the vertical line test, which I'll, I'll write down the vertical line test in a little bit. But any question on that idea? Plugging in one number for x and getting exactly one answer for y. That's a function. Um, you kind of already said that earlier. Domain, those are the numbers you're allowed to plug in to a fu function. Range are the answers that you get out. 
We're dealing with real numbers for now. Okay, so we are not dealing with imaginaries or you know, things like that. Ever or just right now? Uh, just right now. Oh, we will eventually, but uh, for now, everything has to be a real number. When we talk about domain, there's, there's really two things we have to be careful about. When you're dealing with square roots, okay, you're not allowed to take the square root of a negative number. And there's one other thing in math you've got to be careful with. It has to do with fractions. Yep? Um, when it says domain must be a real number, does range not have to be a real number? Yeah, domain, both domain and range. Yeah. Yeah. We'll deal with complex numbers later, but yeah, for now, domain and range will always be real numbers. Um, so yeah, two things you've got to be careful about when you're dealing with domain. Square roots. You've got to make sure you never take the square root of a negative. And something with fractions. What are you not allowed to do in a fraction? You know, some, there's something you can't can't do, like if you try to do this in a fraction. Like yeah? You make, divide something by zero. Yeah, you can't divide by zero. Right? So if you have a fraction, you have something like, uh, something in the top, and let's say you had x plus 2 in the bottom, there is a number you are not allowed to plug in for x because it would cause you to divide by zero. In this case, what, what would that number be? 2. Negative, oh, negative. negative 2. Yeah. So when you're dealing with domain, these are the two things you really have to be careful about. Fractions with variables in the bottom and square roots. Other than that, pretty much every other function we study, most of the time, the domain will be all real numbers. Okay, when we write a function, there are two notations. I've been sticking with this top one. Y equals. Um, does anyone know how you read that bottom one? F of X. F of X, exactly. It means the same thing, it's just a different way to write it. What does F of X mean again? F of X. Um, it means that you have a formula that uses the variable X on the right hand side. If I had something like this, like G of X equals X plus 6. That means the name of my formula is G, and the G formula uses the letter X on the right-hand side. That's all it means. This notation is more common when we have multiple formulas. That way I can say to you, like now, instead of just saying, look at the function, I can say, look at function F, look at function G. Now they have different names. Let's try this one. Okay, what did I say about square roots earlier? You've got to make sure that this is what number or higher? Zero, zero. Yeah. You've got to make sure that this is zero or higher. So what would you be allowed to pick for x? If you did 3 minus 3, that's 0. And so that's the minimum you could do. OK, so you're allowed to pick what for x again? Anything that's? I said anything, anything that's greater than 3. Or greater than Or equal to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, in this case, the domain is any number 3 or higher. So there's two ways you can write that. You can write it like that number three or higher. Or um, let me show you a different way you can write it. Think of that on a number line. Any number three or higher. If you can pick a number three or higher, what's the lowest number you can pick? Three. Three. What's the highest number you can pick? Infinity. Infinity. 
Now, can you include the number three or not include the number three? What do you mean? Like, is it greater than three or greater than or equal to three? Greater than or equal to. In this case, yeah, it's greater than or equal to. I think we talked about that symbol. The book uses a bracket whenever it's an oh, equal to. I remember that. Yep. Now, we can reach the number three. We can include the number three. So we put a bracket. Can you reach infinity? No. 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 You never put a bracket on infinity. <coughs> Bracket means you can include and reach that number. So there's two different ways to write the domain. The first one is called an inequality. The second one is called an interval. Lowest value, comma, highest value. Low, high. So you're going to use a bracket for everything except for infinity? Um, well, if this was, if this happened to be the answer here, greater than three, no, I would not have used a bracket. Oh, because yeah, it's the same thing. Because now I would have used a parenthesis on the three. So you use a bracket when you can include the number. You use a parenthesis when you cannot include it. Let's fix this. Okay, so that's the domain. Um, let's, let's draw it. See what we're looking at. So square root. I'm using most of what I already had typed in from last time. X minus 3. Okay. We know the domain is everything greater than 3. But it's just me. I don't like to have it right on the edge of the screen. So even though I don't need to go to 0, uh, I like to go a little bit past the number that I need. Let's set everything else the way the standard window would be. Negative 10 to 10, and 10 for x max. Square root functions always have that kind of curve. Okay, it's a half, um, half a parabola. All right, now we want the range. Okay, so remember, range is the y variable. Y variable is up and down. So look at that graph. What's the lowest that that graph goes? Zero. Yeah, the lowest it goes is zero. Like if you put a horizontal line, how low could you drag that line before you're not hitting the graph anymore? Goes from zero. And how high does it look like the graph is going to go? I mean, until you can. It doesn't look like it's going to flat out. It's going to keep going up. It's just going to keep going up. If you don't think you understand why you you know set the x max higher so you look further to the right now you can see it's going up 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 it just keeps going oh, it's infinity. so it's infinity yep so the range is every number from 0 including it and up or if you want to think of it this way if you pick numbers 0 and up, what's the lowest number you can pick? 0, zero including 0, because it was equal to. And what's the highest number? Infinity. Can you reach infinity? No. no. So for, that's exactly what you want us to write when it asks us to find the domain and range, or is it just the right side where it's the bracket and parentheses? So this, if I asked you to find the domain and range, write the answer as an inequality. That's the first ones. If I said find the domain and range and write your answer as an interval, that's these two. So these are inequalities. These are intervals. And the third way I could ask you to do it is draw a picture, like I did up here. So I could have you draw the picture, write the inequality, or write the interval. Just different ways of saying the same answer. Let's just do the second one, because I don't think I've shown you how to do absolute value yet. Could you go up one time? Yeah. I'm not going to do that one. Thanks. 
Okay, so two functions I said you've got to be careful with. Square roots and fractions with a letter in the bottom. Does example two have a square root in it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it has this symbol. No, there's no square root. Um, does it have a fraction with a letter in the bottom? No. no. So the two things that I said you need to be careful with aren't in this problem. So what do you think the domain is? The domain is So remember, the two things that give you a problem with the domain are not in this example. So what do you think your domain is? I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be whatever it equals to zero. Right? Okay, here's another question. What kind of numbers are you allowed to raise to the second power? I don't know, but wouldn't you do x would equal 2 to make, to make the... Yeah. What kind of numbers are you allowed to square? Yeah, any real number. You can square anything you want. Positives, negatives, fractions, decimals, or zeros. The two things that would be an issue in the domain are not in this example. If you don't have square roots, and you don't have fractions with variables in the bottom, you don't have to worry about the domain. It's usually just going to be all real numbers. So the lowest value you could pick is negative infinity, and the highest value is positive infinity. I, I don't quite understand why. Like, where you're asking for the domain, which yep. is the valid inputs, and but the valid inputs for what? For what kind of value? Input is always for x. Okay, so. So I'm basically asking what numbers are you allowed to raise to the second power? Solving for the, we're just solving for y. You're solving for the numbers you are allowed to plug in for x. That's domain. So, for example, like if you had square root of x plus two, and I said what's the domain? It would be everything greater than or equal to negative two, because if you try to plug in negative three you're going to end up with a negative number under the root, and you can't do that. So when you're dealing with square roots, you have to be careful about the domain. You can't just fill in any number you want for x. But here, you can. You can take any number you want, raise it to the second power, and minus 4 from that. Because it's not a square root? Yeah, because it's not a square root, and it also doesn't have something like this. It doesn't have a variable in the bottom of a fraction. Taking square roots of negatives and dividing by zero are the, usually the only two things that can mess up your domain. If you don't have either ones of those things in your problem, then your domain is usually all real numbers. Now, the range, that usually you've got to draw a picture to kind of see what it looks like. So let's do math, number, absolute value. Now, if the domain is all real numbers, that means it's going to go left and right forever. Because that's the x-axis. And this does go left and right forever. If you zoom out, it just keeps getting wider and wider. Range is up and down. Uh, does it look like this graph goes down forever? Stops at zero on the y. Stops at zero on the y-axis. Does it look like it goes up forever? Yes. Yeah, it does. So the lowest it goes is how low? Uh, y equals zero. Zero, and does it look like it hits zero? Yes. Yeah, it does. If you plug in two for x, or if you plug in negative two for x, you'll hit zero in both spots. So the lowest it goes is zero, and the highest?
Well, Cassidy, what's the highest it goes? Yeah, it goes all the way up to infinity. So range is usually something you figure out by looking at the graph. Domain is something you figure out by asking yourself two questions. Do I have a square root? Do I have a fraction with a letter in the bottom? If you don't have either one of those, then your domain is going to be all real numbers. Any question on that? Well, something like this. What would the domain be in that problem? It would be uh, greater than or equal to 5 because it's at the bottom of a fraction. So it's OK to plug in the number 5 right there? Uh, yes. So if you do 5 minus 5, what do you get? 0. And what's 3 divided by 0? Oh, OK. So, you can't, so the greatest number, or the lowest number you can do is 15. Greater than or equal to 15. Think of it this way. What number? can you not use that? Five. five. So the domain there is every number except the number five. You can plug in six, you can plug in seven, you can plug in zero for x, you can plug in negative eight for x. But if you try to plug in five, you're going to divide by zero, and you can't do that. Okay. So when you have a fraction with a letter in the, bottom, in the bottom, it's usually just one number that you can't use. In this case, just the number five. Okay, how about the domain here? What could you pick for numbers there that would be okay to plug in for x? To, sorry, you can you say it again? What number? Four. Yeah, exactly. Greater than or equal to four. Yep. I couldn't do three. If you plug in three, three minus four is negative one. Can't take the square root of a negative number. Yep. So any number four or higher would be the domain. Yep. It takes a little practice to get good with domain, but we'll we'll practice. Evaluate. What is that? So evaluate, when you see that on like a test or the homework, it just means to take the number they give you and then plug it in and see what you get. That's what evaluate means. So what they usually do is they'll give you a formula. They'll give you a number or something that they want you to plug in. And then you just write down what you get. So let's, uh, let's try this one. Let's do f of negative 2. That means take negative 2, and everywhere you see an x, fill in negative 2, and then figure out what the answer is. So change x to negative 2. And again, why negative 2? Well, that's just the number they picked in this problem. What's uh, negative 2 squared? 4. 4, and then plus 1? 5. Five. That's what it means to evaluate. Um, let's try another one. Let's do, uh, let's find f of 3. So if you plug in 3 for x, what would you get for an answer? James? Uh, 3 over 3. It would just be 3 if it's like a 10. 10. 10. Right. You plug in 3 for x. That's 3 to the second power is 9 plus 1 is 10. Um, what if you plug in a? Yep. You get a squared plus 1. You just get a squared plus 1. So sometimes when you evaluate, if they're having you plug in a letter, well, there's nothing else you can do. That's it. Questions on what it means to evaluate. Just plug in whatever they give you for the letter and 
simplify it as much as you can. So earlier I mentioned kind of a way people use in Algebra 1 to figure out if something is a function. And a lot of people remember the vertical line test. A lot of times I'll abbreviate it like VLT. If you have a graph and you draw a vertical line and it only hits it once, that is a function. So let's say I drew um, something like this. Uh, Brett, is that a function? No. Why not? Because if you're going to draw a vertical line. You're not Brett. But that's okay. <laughs> Brett. No, because it would pass two points. Yeah. If um, you, you were right on track, though. Um, if you draw a vertical line, it hits it more than once. Okay, so that's not a function. How about if I did something like this? So if I draw a vertical line, where does it hit more than once? Well, that's my axis. Right, this is my y-axis. That's my x-axis. So where does it hit more than once? I mean, it's the x-axis more than once. No, you're looking, so it, your graph is the thing that's in red. So where does the vertical line hit the red line more than once? Never. Never. Oh, okay. Yeah. So your graph you're looking at is what's in red. The vertical line never hits it more than once. What's in red is a function. Okay, so that's that's the vertical line test. Any question on the vertical line test? Yeah. Yeah, she, she meant that like it, Where? That vertical line is only hitting the red, the red parts on the uh, Yeah, we're looking where the red and the black cross. Oh, I'm in the blue. Yeah, the blue, that's just my, that'd be like my graph paper, the, the x and y axis. Right. Yeah. I agree, a horizontal line would hit it more than once. Um, that's difficult. Okay, but the vertical line test means it never hits your graph more than once. So something like a circle fails the vertical line test. Um, how about a parabola? Does that pass the vertical line test or fail it? Yeah, yeah, that passes it. How about we've been looking at like a square root function? Does that pass the vertical line test or fail? Yeah, that passes. Um, all right, let's try another one. Just practice another domain and range. This time they want me to graph 16x minus x cubed. Now, to find domain, you generally don't need to graph it. You just ask yourself two questions. Are there any square roots in that problem? What do you think, Brett? Um, no, the cube root would look like this. So we don't have a cube root. We have a cube. But we don't have a cube root. There's no, square. There's no square roots in that problem. Nope. Are there any fractions with letters in the bottom of that? No. So what do you think my domain is then? How about um, Kyle? What do you think? Wait, what's my domain? I thought you were asking if the fractions. No, so yeah, so what would my domain be? So there's no square roots, there's nothing with fractions that have letters in the bottom. All so real numbers. all real numbers. You can take any number you want and multiply it by 16. There's no restriction in math when you multiply something by 16. You can take any number you want and cube it. Right? So the domain is all real numbers. 
how do we usually get the range? What do we do to help us find that? Well, range is output. On Domain is output. output. Yeah. Outputs. But what have we usually been doing to find the range? They said this will this will help you to see the range a lot better. Yeah. What do we do on the calculator? Um, so that's to see if it's a function. But range is how high and low it goes. Oh, so you just graph it. Just graph it. Yeah. We just graph it and look at the picture and see how high and low does it go. 16x minus x cubed. And what's a good starting window that we usually use? Seven. Yep. Two. Six. Okay, that's an okay starting point. Um, can we see what's happening really well in the graph? No. What needs, two things need to be adjusted under the window? What, what do you think the two things are? Yeah? The X, right? um, X is okay. I'm not worried about left to right. In fact, I still have a little bit of extra. Y min, Y max. The Y min and Y max. How do you get the uh, cube on the calculator? Um, raising something to the third power. So you press um, the carrot. That's what they call it, the little up arrow thing, and then press 3. Okay. All right, so let's try, we don't know how high and low, but let's try, I don't know, negative 30 and 30. So now we're going to see a lot higher and lower. Okay. Is that a good one? Looks good. Um, how high does it look like this graph is going to go? Yeah. Infinite. Yeah. How low does it look like it's going to go? Infinite. Yeah. So the range is all numbers from negative infinity to infinity. You can plug in any number you want, and you'll get every possible number out as an answer. Question on that one before we um, look at our last question. I doubt there's some homework. There will be some homework. Well, I gave you part of it already, right? First page. It was like six questions, I think. Yeah. Yeah. First page. Yeah, it was on the board. Yeah. He was Why the oh, you're in the bathroom. I can put it back. Up. All right. So our last question. Uh, we have a pool that has dimensions of 30 by 50, and it's rectangular. They're going to put a sidewalk okay, around the pool, and the sidewalk is going to be the same width all the way around the pool. So it's going to be like a rectangular shape all the way around. They don't tell us the width of the sidewalk. That's what we have to find. But we know the area of the sidewalk is 600 square feet. Find the width. So in this problem, they give you a lot of, a lot of words. What do you think would make this easier to understand, all that information, if we just had a what to go with it? Yeah? Correct. Yeah, a picture. Yeah, I would draw, draw a picture so we can see what's going on. Um, what's something that would be important to put in the picture? Yeah. The pool. Yeah, the pool. All right, let me put, let me put that in the picture. And is that the dimension 30 by 50? So 
the pool is 30 by 50. Um, what else is something that would be important to put in the picture? Besides the pool. Yeah, the sidewalk. The sidewalk goes all the way around the pool. So to put in a sidewalk, easiest thing is just go like, there's your sidewalk. Okay. What's the width of the sidewalk? We don't know. But what do they tell us it is what do they tell tell us to use for now? For the width. They tell us to use What do they tell us to use for the width for now? X. X. So the width is going to be X. And now we need to find the width of that sidewalk. What's the piece of information we haven't used? The 600. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't used the 600. Okay, that's the area of the sidewalk. So let's write it. area of the sidewalk. Let me make this one a different color. Looking at the red rec rectangle and the black rectangle, if you knew the area of both of them, how would you find the area of the sidewalk? If you knew the area of the red and the area of the black. The black is, is the pool, I guess. Yeah. Subtract the Yeah. Subtract the area of the pool from what? From the area of the sidewalk. Or the area of the whole thing. Yeah, and which rectangle represents the whole thing? The red. Exactly. So the area of the sidewalk is the big rectangle, and then cut the pool out of the middle of it, and you're left with just the sidewalk. What did they tell us the area of the sidewalk is? How much is the area of the sidewalk? About, uh, Logan? Uh, 600 feet Yep, 600. Let's come back to the red rectangle. How about the area of the pool? William, what's the area of the pool? Uh, yep, 1,500. And how did you figure that out? What's the formula for? Um, it's like length times width. Length times width, yep. So what's the only thing that we're missing that I left the space for? Area of the red. And you said area of a rectangle is what, what times what? Length times width. Length times width. So we have, all we have to do is find the length and the width of that red rectangle. Well, how far is it from there to there on the red rectangle? 50. That's 50 units. That's 50 from there to there. How about? in that area right there. We do have a way to represent it though. This is the sidewalk. How wide is the sidewalk? Yep. And how about that space right there? X. So what's the length of the, the length of the red rectangle? 50 plus 2x. Mm -hmm. 2x plus 50, thank you. And how about the width of the red rectangle? Think of it like this. 30 plus 30. Yep, 30 plus the sidewalk on the top and the bottom. Okay, so that's the formula that we're going to have to use to solve for x. So just make sure you copy, copy that. 
and then tomorrow we'll solve it. All right, so let me put up, um, I'm going to adjust, i got to adjust the homework a little bit. Okay, um, the first part of the homework, uh, that was the page, that was the page 20. We were almost done, but we'll finish it. And I didn't give you all those. What were the um, questions on page 20? Six, seven, eight, nine. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 18, and 29? Yep. Okay. And let me just change page 30. Okay, vertical line test. Yep, we got to that. Page 30, uh, it will be the 3 through 8, 11, 13, and 16. So it's about six, I think it's 16 questions. Right? Right. So we'll uh, take a look at that first thing tomorrow, and then we'll finish up uh, what we're doing today.